Hello, everyone. It's 3.30 in the afternoon here in Colorado, and it's time for uh, an, a seminar. Welcome to the 2022 ACON Seminar Series. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Lee. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Science at Baylor University. Dr. Lee received her PhD at the University of Michigan, where she applied and developed a large eddy simulation model and regional chemical transfer models to interpret the vertical distribution of biogenic volatile organic compounds. Before joining Baylor, she was a postdoc fellow at, the, uh, at Harvard University, where she worked on methane SAD and methane air data analysis and uh, relative science application with a focus on greenhouse gases, uh, flux inversion, and she used uh, a coupled modeling framework to investigate the impacts of future changes in climate, vegetation, and land use practices on dust and wildfire activity. Um, Dr. Lee research interests span from local atmospheric chemistry modeling of trace gases and aerosols to global interpretation of climate and air quality co-benefits. And today she'll be talking to us about what drives changes in, fire, uh, in fine particular matter under the ongoing climate change and changes in land use with particular focus on wildfire emissions and mineral dust. Before starting, I would like to remind you that you can enter your questions uh, in the space below uh, at any time during the talk. And then the end uh, of the presentation, I will read those questions uh, to Yang. Uh, with that, I introduce you Dr. Lee. Yang, please take it away. Thank you for, so much for the introduction. Okay, so today we're gonna discuss future wildfire and dust in the Western US. Uh, hopefully after this talk, you can have a rough idea about what may drive changes in five particular matter under the 21st century climate change and land use. And the contents uh, that form this talk uh, are basically uh, my previous uh, two publications. One is um, the, response of, uh, the response of dust uh, in the Southwest North America. The other is the change and the spatial shift in lightning fires. So, uh, to begin with, I mean, I want to also acknowledge uh, the support from Harvard and Material Chemical uh, Modeling Group, especially my postdoc advisor, Dr. Loretta Bigley, and my collaborator, Dr. Jed Kaplan at Hong Kong University. And also, I want to acknowledge the funding source for these uh, two projects, and that's the US EPA. Okay, to um, begin with, so we know like there are lots of uh, sources uh, for dust. Uh, we have the natural emissions. We also have a lot of anthropogenic sources. Um, so in the atmosphere, we definitely have a lot of primary particles, meaning they come from as, as particle uh, directly from the, the emission source. They can also form uh, through the photochemical processes and then they can have the secondary, maybe organic aerosols or the secondary particles. And all these particles, uh, they can influence visibility. They can also influence radiative forcing directly or indirectly. And the particles, we know they all have um, adverse impacts for human health, especially once inhaled. Um, they can, uh, there is a um, respiratory disease uh, can, 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 can be caused, and also they can cause uh, cardiovascular disease. So from this different perspective, it is very important to understand like where they come from and also how they change under future climate. So in this project, I mean, in this presentation, I focus on two projects. One is related to dust and one is related to wildfire. These are uh, the two important uh, sources of natural particles. Okay, we're gonna start with uh, wildfire first. So now you are looking at one uh, interesting map, which is for the Western US. Uh, this is developed by Liu et al. And uh, you can see the redness color that represents the number of uh, smoke wave days uh, that's per year. And they define the smoke wave as larger than two consecutive days with daily wildfire specific PM2.5 larger than 20 microgram per meter cube. And uh, so you'll notice for a lot of regions, especially for large forest areas, uh, there are lots of um, like uh, influential area from the smoke and there's a high um, smoke wave days. And uh, for other regions, like if you zoom in to see a few uh, counties, you can see these, uh, these counties with uh, slash lines. And these are the counties with high population larger than 75K. And that's also meaning that a large population is actually exposed to high concentration of the wildfire smoke. So from the health perspective, we definitely need to understand more like about uh, like wildfire change and their future climate. 
And this paper also performed some analysis and then to study the correlation between the percentage increase in respiratory hospital admission due to the smoke. And here they found if they define the smoke wave days uh, using a, a higher threshold, and then they found there is a positive correlation and there is a strong increase in the risk of uh, respiratory admissions during smoke wave days compared to the non-smoke wave days, and the increase is about uh, like 7%. So that's strong evidence to show this is uh, really harmful to human being. So temporally, and this is a very interesting paper showing how wildfire change over the recent decades. So Wesley et al. this study, like how large wildfires, um, they change the, uh, over the past uh, three decades, like four decades. And um, in this figure, especially the figure on the top, you can see the changes in temperature uh, averaged over uh, from March to August. And this is average over the Western US. And then for the red bar, that's actually the wildfire frequency. So you notice there is an increasing annual frequency of large um, Western US wildfires. And then they use um, 1986 as a, as a divide, uh, dividing point and then to compare what's happening after and what's happening before. So there's definitely like a maybe four to six uh, fold uh, increase in wildfire frequency. And for the lower panel, you can see the changes in fire season. And this is uh, um, the figure showing the first discovery of fire, last discovery, and last control. And again, you can uh, have a rough idea about how fire season kind of become uh, uh, longer and longer uh, in the recent decades. So that's uh, another strong motivation for our research. And one more interesting figure I wanted to show is, this is also like a very surprising figure to me when I, I, the first time I saw this one. So this figure shows uh, the top 20 largest California wildfires. So you may notice if you zoom in to see all these large fires, so they mention like all but three of the top 25, uh, 20 fires uh, in California that happened uh, since 2000. And then if you see the, what's going on for the recent years, and actually the majority of uh, these large fires in California actually they happened in the last two years. And um, so these regions actually projected to become warmer and also drier in coming decades could potentially see larger increase in wildfire smoke. So because of the importance of fire and also the, uh, the importance to see how it changed uh, the, the motivation of this. So there are many researchers uh, they have already studied, uh, try to perform the simulation uh, and try to build a model to, uh, to predict how fire can change. So for these studies, I summarize this table. These uh, are basically used uh, statistical methods. They can focus on the Western US, uh, California, or the whole US. And they focus on different fire metrics, such as fire severity, uh, the fire risk uh, ever burned, and uh, also the wildfire smoke emissions such as by carbon, organic carbon. And they found all these parameters uh, like metrics have increased and uh, based on this, uh, this um, statistical method. So for the statistical models, uh, they basically relate meteorological variables uh, to fire metrics such as air burn, and then to build a model and then to use future meteorology variables to uh, kind of predict the future fire. Um, generally, the, the, uh, these statistical models uh, do not take into account the effects of uh, climate change or the, uh, or the increase on um, CO2 fertilization in uh, the vegetation. And in general, they also neglect um, the anthropogenic land yield changes. So uh, if we want to see uh, like, like, like the detailed driver for wildfire, we still need to uh, kind of try uh, to develop more uh, methods to uh, reach our goal. And here, Many people know um, like wildfire kind of rely on the, uh, the field load and also land use, like a lot of factors can drive in the wildfire. So they try to use the vegetation model and land model uh, to couple with uh, climate models, try to study uh, the future. And again, they all see an uh, increasing trend in fire metrics in certain way. And uh, yeah, so this is a, a big increase for uh, like the enhancement in our understanding uh, based on this method. However, there are still a large uncertainties uh, for this um, model prediction. And this is also like the motivation of our research because we really want to zoom in to see the wildfire um, perspective and also like how wildfire is driven by land use and also land cover, especially the vegetation side. 
And for this model, they can definitely integrate uh, terrestrial vegetation dynamic and land atmospheric exchanges and other key physical paralysis. And this can also be achieved uh, through our model, which I'm gonna talk uh, in the next slide, and also allow the consideration of many manufacturers that can drive wildfire activity and the smoke uh, pollution on the regional scale. So here, uh, to uh, predict the future wildfire activity, we want to focus on like a few scenarios. I'm showing here are the uh, four representative concentration pathways under CIMIC-5, and uh, it's capture a range of possible climate trajectory over the 21st century. And uh, we are going to focus on these two, the RCP 8.5, which is a high emission scenario, and uh, assume increasing greenhouse gases along the whole 21st century. We also focus on a moderate scenario, which is RCP 4.5, and that's an assumption that uh, assume a gradual reduction after 2050. And uh, for each scenario, we'll focus on three time slices, including the present day, uh, the mid of 21st century, and the end of 21st century. Okay, so here is our integrated vegetation climate model setup, and this is used for the future fire. And for meteorology data, we get the data from CIMIC-5 and we use case meteorology in specific to drive our vegetation model. And also we consider future land use and future CO2 concentration. And these are all coming from CIMIC-5. And this is a model we use, LPJLM fire model. This is a global dynamic vegetation model. It also has a fire module that allow us to study fire uh, influence. And the simulation can generate different uh, living biomass, and this is uh, per, uh, also generate uh, the, the biomass burned uh, per plant functional type. And in combination with emission factors from different literatures, and then we can calculate the fire emissions, and then we treat, uh, we feed everything, like all the fire emissions for different uh, plant functional type to geoscan, and then we perform a global simulation and the nested grid simulation to reach a higher concentration, and then we study the distribution and the variation of present day and future fire uh, smoke concentration. So in general, we have two RCPs, and then for each RCP, we have uh, three time slices, and then uh, we perform global simulation, which is at the four by five degree uh, resolution, and the zoom in uh, domain, which is a nice domain, which has the 0.5 by 0.625 degree resolution. So that's our model setup. So um, to show the results, so here I wanna show some of the results from the LPJ um, fire um, emissions uh, first. So here I'm showing a map, uh, which is a fire dry matter burned. And you'll notice the boundary of the national forests and national parks, because we really want to see the wildfire changes. So that's why we limit our domain to the national forests and national parks. And we also know that the lightning cause wildfire actually accounts for the majority of the burned area over the Western US. And that's another motivation why we focus on this region. And uh, when I compare the LPJIM simulated uh, like dry matter burn on the left with the g 4 as um, like observed um, fire emissions on the right, we notice some differences. And uh, so that's basically because uh, because of active human suppression and which is not considered in our model. This is uh, the pure vegetation model. We didn't consider the human impacts. Also, um, since we focus on the wildfire, uh, this is a forest area. So that's also like another reason that we didn't uh, consider human impacts. But in general, for the total over the fire season, which is July, August, September, you can see the total is kind of comparable. So in general, uh, so for the present day fire simulation, and then this is uh, our simulated dry matter burned over the national forest national parks. And this is comparable like to the GFAT, uh, especially on the magnitude. And so for the GFAT, we do see a higher uh, dry matter burn over the Northern Washington and Idaho, and also the Northern California area. And uh, this, as I mentioned earlier, this spatial mismatch that's basically be, uh, because uh, the active fire subtraction uh, is not considered uh, in our model. So we notice like the fire emission is kind of on a reasonable magnitude and uh, reasonable level. So we want to proceed to see to use the geoscam to simulate uh, the uh, fire smoke concentration. 
So here I'm showing the results of uh, wildfire smoke, and uh, this is for different resolution. And the right hand side that's the coarse resolution, and then the left that's the high resolution. And the comparison is between the geoscam simulated contours, uh, the background contours, and the dots represent the improved observations. And uh, you may notice, so geoscam generally kind of capture the high um, smoke region, especially here, and uh, as uh, observed by uh, improved data set. And here also I do the this linear regression and then to see this um, um, the match uh, kind of reasonably while. And I also want to uh, kind of mention that for the National Forest National Park region, we use the LPG model. And for the other areas that outside the boundary, we still use the GFAT emission because this, this um, region, they still have like large um, human activity. So that's why I want to keep all this human activity, human influence to the smoke and then to make sure uh, the geos can simulate results can be comparable to uh, the improved data set. And this is a reasonable comparison. Okay, so after we confirm the, the present day simulation is reasonable. So now I want to look into the future. And here we want to see the, how the change um, in different uh, meteorological parameters are kind of like behave. And um, so for different parameters, different uh, meteorological parameters, I show uh, how things change in between 2050 and the present day. And uh, this is the first panel. And then I also show the difference between 2100 and the present day, this is second panel. And for each parameter, I show the results under the two RCPs, which is RCP 4.5 and 8.5. And in general, uh, you can see uh, the increasing trend uh, of uh, temperature for all the scenarios and uh, along the whole 21st century. And for precipitation, and uh, this warmer color actually represents the drier condition. And you see in most of the Western US area, um, the area actually become drier and drier. And interestingly, we didn't see like a statistical significant changes in lightning density, but uh, uh, so it is kind of like evidence to show that temperature and the precipitation is as a, uh, serving as the main driver for the future dust. And after we look at the meteorological factors, we also want to see how vegetation change under future, uh, future climate. So I'm showing three uh, dominant plant functional type in the Western US, including the temperate um, broadleaf uh, evergreen, and then the boreal needleleaf evergreen, and this uh, boreal summer green. And you can see, again, I'm showing the difference uh, between uh, the mid 21st century and the present day and the end of 21st century and the present day. And also I'm showing them for different RCPs. And I want to circle a few things and hi highlight a few things. For the temperate broadleaf summer green, you may notice there is an increasing trend of these um, uh, plants actually to the north of um, the Western US. And uh, for the boreal um, plants, you can see, basically you can see there is a decreasing trend for these kind of species. And if you imagine the temperature uh, increase, temperature decrease, so this um, area is no longer considered like habitable for this kind of species. And so that's in general why we see this kind of like latitudinal trend. And we're also interested in seeing like how um, the total kind of change along different latitudes. So that's why we kind of like make further plot along different latitudes. And then this time we want to see the total living bell mass because this serve as the fuel, uh, the, the fuel load. And uh, for different lines, and that's represent different type of slices. The green represent the present day and the blue represent the 21st century and uh, the red represent the end of uh, 21st century. So you can see there are some minor differences for the RCP 8.5, but for RCP, I mean 4.5, 4, but there's an obvious change under RCP 8.5, especially in between 21st century and uh, the present day. So we want to zoom in a little bit. So now we calculate the difference. We also want to see whether these differences are statistical significant. So you'll notice these dots, these red dots represent um, the statistical significance for the difference between 2100 and 2010. And then the blue dots represent the difference in, uh, uh, for the 2050 and the 2010. And uh, for RCP 8.5, you can see there is an increasing trend for the total living biomass to the north, as, I, as we see in the earlier map. And for RCP 8.5, there's actually decreasing 
area here. So that's a huge decrease under um, RCP 8.5 and this by the end of 21st century. And then after we see the vegetation, we also want to see how fire change. And this time we see um, the calculated based on the dry matter burn and again based on different time slices and different RCPs. And for RCP uh, 4.5, we can see some minor increase uh, in the dry matter burn uh, centered at 45 degree north. And for RCP 8.5, you can see a clear increase of these fire emissions uh, under uh, centered around 45 degrees. And it's really interesting because if you consider the two, actually the total living biomass uh, has been decreased. And then this one actually, the fire actually increased. And I was curious why. However, if you think about that, and then if you consider this map, you can see there are actually still a lot of fuel load to put support the burning. So even though you may see a decrease in vegetation, there's still a lot of things to support the burning. So that's the reason. Okay, so now we go back to the, we, we go to see the map of the dry matter burned over the national forest and national parks. And this is again under four different RCPs. And then uh, this uh, here, I'm only showing you the difference between 2100 and the present day to show the big difference. And for RCP 8.5, you can see the increase actually scattered across different Western US. For RCP 8.5, uh, it's kind of consistent with the latitude in the map, like a lot of increase actually happening here. And then we use GeoSCAM to run the simulation uh, based on this wildfire emission. And then we can see how the smoke concentration change under different RCP. And uh, for RCP 8.5, the black carbon, organic carbon combined um, smoke particulate the matter actually increase here and uh, in the northern area, but it's still not too uh, severe. However, when you see the RCP 8.5, and this is um, kind of in line with, uh, with the, the increase in the dry matter burn. And there are lots of increase to over this area. And these are actually the national forest area. And I have to say this um, big block here, this is the national stone, uh, uh, this is the Yellowstone National Park. And the reason for that again is there are enough fuel load to support the burning. Okay, so uh, this is the, actually that's the, the end of the, the wildfire story. And then let's see another um, like source for the fine particulate matter, which is dust. So now we were looking at we are looking at the geo, uh, uh, the GOES 16 satellite observations. And uh, you can see, uh, maybe you can take a closer look at this region, and then it's gonna come back. This pink color actually represents uh, dust. So this dust actually generated uh, from this um, Western US and then start to spread and then over kind of reach uh, to the northern part of the Texas. So it's a, it can influence like a big area, even though the starting like the source point is source um, points is only here. So this is a large uh, plume. And we did see a lot of large uh, dust plume in recent years. And here I'm gonna show you some of the, uh, the evidence and uh, here I'm showing the number of dust records and also the mean PM10 concentration. So the right line that's the number of dust and you can see generally we do see an increasing trend in the number of dust and the blue line is the PM10 and uh, so maybe we can now see like an obvious increase and this is also saying that um, a lot of particles like the dust form that's actually fine particles. And also we can see um, the annual variation of dust, which is uh, in 1990s and also around 2000s. And then here the dashed line, this is 1990s situation. And then the solid black line is the, turn, uh, the 2000 situation. So you notice, so spring is actually the highest dust activity, which has also increased from the 1990s to the 2000s. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting and also uh, a good evidence to show that it is increasing. And here is another motivation like why we want to study dust. And um, so there has been like a few studies dimensioned uh, valley favor is correlated with uh, the frequency of dust storm. So valley favor is actually a fast rising infectious disease. And it's actually because of the little little fungi which exists in the, in the soil particles. And this soil particle kind of like is part of the, the dust and then can be transported long distance and that's how they can um, be influenced. So you can see the upper um, 
figure the upper map actually show the spatial distribution of uh, detected dust storms from the improved uh, network. So the open circle that I mentioned, that's actually the improved uh, size. And this one, these black ones, they represent uh, the dust storm numbers that can be identified at different location. So the lower panel, you can see the frequency, um, I mean, the number of uh, valley favor incidences reported in each state over the whole US. And then there's a uh, like a clear correlation between the two. So that's a, a really huge health concern. And uh, that's also why we wanna study dust, uh, especially under future climate. So we know there are many factors can drive uh, dust in the, in, the, in the atmosphere. So once dust is emitted and then it can go through the lift, uplifting processes and actually become the airborne dust. And then this airborne dust can actually influence the cloud properties and influence precipitation pattern. And once this dust settled, uh, they can go through the dust deposition processes. And uh, then that's also related to the bioproductivity and uh, contribute to the CO2 sink. And this CO2 can also influence the land surface, especially um, they influence the vegetation cover, like from the soil perspective. Um, and uh, so, and also dust is directly, and the emission side is directly influenced by the wind and also some other like temperature precipitation um, like parameters. So in general, you may notice there are three main perspectives that can uh, influence dust, which is climate, land use or vegetation, and also uh, CO2. So um, we keep these different parameters, I mean, the, the drivers in mind, and then we want to choose a, a suitable dust mobilization scheme to uh, study the future dust. So traditionally, there are two different mobilization schemes can be used in GeoScam. So one it is called the, the dust entrainment and uh, deposition scheme of standards. It is called, also called the dead dust scheme. And then they do the calculation of horizontal saltation flux. And then based on this saltation flux, and the scheme can calculate the vertical dust flux. And this vertical dust flux not only rely on the saltation flux, it also relies on the fractional area of land that's suitable for mobilization. And this AM part depends on like the, the snow surface, uh, like lake surface, wetland surface, and especially vegetation surface. And this vegetation, there is an anti-linear correlation. So if you have higher vegetation cover, that means your dust is gonna be less. And on the other hand side, there is a, uh, the Gino uh, scheme, which is developed for the go kart chemical transport model. And this calculation basically based on the wind speed, and but this calculation is restricted to persistent arid uh, regions. So the region and actually based on the this is basically basically focused on the desert region in the southwest. And uh, here, that's again I'm showing showing you the, like how this uh, horizontal saltation flux uh, kind of play a role, and uh, this is the wind, and then kind of cause the saltation, and then you can generate dust, and some of them can support uh, suspend it into the atmosphere. Okay, so here I'm showing uh, showing you the comparison uh, between calculated uh, using different. Uh, mobilization schemes and then compare that with the improved observations. So here I'm showing the annual mean uh, surface fine dust concentration in the West US. So for the improved data set, that's the observation. And then for uh, go card result is here and then the that uh, result is here. So for the go card, and they simulated uh, actually a high um, concentration over uh, this area. This is basically the um, the southwest area of the US. And this is pretty high, like much higher than the improve. There's some uh, deficiency here. And for the that, there's something similar for the, but this time it's kind of like uh, the mismatch is over the north. And um, in the Faraday paper, they try to combine the two and trying to take uh, the good use of the two schemes. And so they use this that and go card combined scheme. And this time they not only they restrict emissions to persistent desert and semi-desert areas, and they also uh, assume like they can surprise emissions when there's a snow cover. And then this combined um, scheme actually have the better, show the better um, uh, like comparison with the, with the observations. And uh, however, this scheme still uh, doesn't consider the land use change over time. 
And that's also why we want to choose that DAS scheme. Uh, that's because this is a, uh, has a strong focus uh, that I also allow us to take into account the vegetation factor. And this also is uh, what we're going to do uh, for this research. And since we focus on basically here, this is Southwestern US, and then for the DAT, uh, the DAT DAS scheme actually behave pretty well for this region. And that's another reason uh, we think that that uh, scheme is reasonable to, to choose. Okay, so besides uh, like the scheme to choose, there are also some other things to worry about. And uh, the wind represent representation is also something to consider. So before they use like a like more general uh, way to uh, kind of like the, treat the wind uh, in different grid, and then there's a mismatch or conservation uh, across of dust across different resolution. So you see for the art, for for the coarse resolution, which is four by five, that's about like uh, seventy one uh, teragram um, per total of total dust. However, if you go to two by two one five degree resolution, you can see dust actually increase. I don't know why. I mean. And then people zoom in to see this region, and that's because um, the because of the treatment of wind is not reasonable. They, they will apply this kind of like equally uh, treated wind in different um, grid, and that's not uh, a reasonable way to treat, treat it. And then rarely at all, they use a wind bell probability distribution to treat the wind, to treat the wind in the in each grid, and they kind of treat these. Uh, the fractional wind uh, as a, a separate variable uh, when averaging the high resolution winds, addressing the inequity. And also when this mean wind speed in a, uh, in a grid box is below the threshold, and then the scheme can represent the wind uh, with a probability distribution. And now you can see the results. And uh, so these results definitely uh, conquer the like on conservation of dust across uh, different resolution. And this is also what we're going to use for this research. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, we really want to see how vegetation can cause effects. And uh, for the dust scheme, uh, it relies on the fractional area, which is, uh, which is basically the parameter to represent the fraction of um, the, the buyer soil exposed in the inner grid cell, because this is uh, the region that can generate dust. And we can totally rely on the vegetation. This is, uh, um, as I mentioned, if uh, we see an increase in vegetation, then there's a, gonna be a decrease, decrease in dust. And uh, instead of like only look at the leaf area index as in um, most studies, and we calculate based on the vegetation area index, which not only includes leaves and also include branches and the stems. And in this uh, calculation, we also treat like woody and grassy uh, plants uh, separately to make sure we kind of um, give it a reasonable assumption and uh, to treat uh, the dust generation. And here we also define a threshold for the complete suppression of dust emission. That means if you have the, the vegetation cover which is larger than threshold, then the dust will not be generated. So on the right-hand side, I'm showing the results. This is basically the, the, the present-day spring vegetation area index uh, that is simulated from the LPJ model. And then this is the distribution of these. And then we also want to see whether the simulation is reasonable. Also, we want to compare the LPJ results with the default vegetation error index that used in the GeoScan model. So here you can see we do have some errors with this discrepancy. And uh, but for the southwestern uh, North America area, and then so the difference is kind of minor, and I think that's also like make us think it's pretty reasonable to kind of use these, um, these results uh, to uh, kind of like study dust and to calculate dust emission. So, yeah. Okay, so now we have uh, the LPJ simulated vegetation error index that is actually at the resolution 0.5 by 0.25. And we simulated over RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 and over the 21st century. And for the meteorological fields, we use the marathon meteorology, and this is a global simul global data set. So we can basically simulate uh, dust everywhere. And then we use a Hamco standalone scheme to generate dust emissions offline, and then output all the emissions for uh, the four um, dust size bins. And here are the four size bins on uh, the radii of these bins. 
and the minimum is uh, the smallest is from 0.1 to 1, and then the largest is from uh, 3 to 6. And then once we have the emissions, we, we switch off the, the default that dust emission model and then read in our new uh, dust emission under future climate. And we use a scaling factor as um, as the performance for most of the other emissions that treat in uh, GeoScan and to make sure where um, our simulation is on the right uh, magnitude uh, to match the realistic conditions. And again, for this simulation, we also focus on, for this study, we also focus on two RCPs and this RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. <clears throat> and um, this is a, a similar setup uh, as in our fire research. And we use meteorological data from CME5. And uh, so this time we're gonna consider uh, climate land use uh, CO2 separately. Uh, so the LPG LMO fire can generate land cover data, especially we use these to calculate the vegetation area index. And uh, so I wanna highlight that like few uh, private studies has considered the separate effects of CO2 fertilization and changing land cover. And then we use this data and then to calculate offline dust emissions and then use the offline dust emissions to drive the geoscan. And then we can generate the distribution and variation for present day and future fine dust concentration. So in general, we have three scenarios. One is the all factor scenario. That means we consider climate, land use and CO2 fertilization to the, uh, for the vegetation. And we also have this fixed CO2 scenario. So we assume only climate and land use change under uh, like future climate through the 21st century. And uh, we also have this uh, fi fixed land use scenario. So this time only climate and CO2 will change. So I'm gonna show the results, uh, focus on uh, different scenarios in a bit. But first, uh, I also try to confirm the present simulation is reasonable. So for the present day, I'm showing the vegetation area index on the left and the emission is on the right. So you may notice like the LPG model simulates high present day vegetation uh, along the mountains in Arizona and also Mexico under RCP 4.5 and for the fixed CO2 scenario. And um, for the emissions, and these are actually elevated, uh, like high emission actually over this area has some um, thing in the in Arizona region, New Mexico region, and uh, the Mexico border. And then we try to use GeoScan simulation uh, to kind of compare with an uh, improved data set. And you can see the dots that skew the improved data set and background color that's the, the simulated uh, results. And uh, so actually the high fine dust concentration are simulated again in Arizona, uh, New Mexico and the Mexico border by Jules Cam. And uh, they match reasonably well. And on the right hand side, I'm showing the temporal series. Uh, and then you can see, um, so the dots actually the improved data set. And uh, this is for one of the scenario, uh, one of the RCPs. And I'm showing both the four by five uh, resolution and also the uh, 0 0.5 by 0 0.625 resolution. So you can see um, dust actually conserve across uh, the resolution and they also match with the observations pretty well. Uh, so this is in over different years, it's pretty good. So after we confirm the present day simulation is reasonable, now let's look at the future. So here we're showing uh, the vegetation cover in future springtime and um, these are the results for RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 for the all factor scenario. That means we consider climate, uh, climate change, land use change, and also CO2 fertilization to enhance uh, vegetation. So generally you can see uh, the RCP 8.5 can simulate like higher vegetation uh, than the RCP uh, 4.5, especially over these two uh, regions. And then if we look at other scenarios, this is the fixed CO2 scenario. And you can see the vegetation area index actually decreased significantly in, in Mexico and also over mountains in the Mexico area. So it's pretty different from the all factor scenario. And uh, basically here over this whole area. And then we also want to see the fixed land use scenario. And it's pretty similar to the all factor scenario if you take a closer look. And uh, yeah, it's just the fixed CO2 scenario is um, like really concerning because uh, decreasing vegetation means uh, you know, increase in vegetation, I mean, increase in dust emission. 
And then I see the dust emission scenario. So again, I'm showing for uh, for showing three different scenarios and for RCT 4.5 and 8.5. And you may notice for most of the regions, you can see a decreasing trend of um, fine dust uh, emissions over Arizona and New Mexico, but increasing emission along the uh, Mexico uh, northern border area. And uh, these two, again, they're pretty similar, and especially under RCT 4.5. But then if you will take a look at the middle scenario, which is a big CO2 scenario, and that's pretty different. And then you can actually see um, fine dust emissions actually increase significantly in this whole area. And then we move on to um, see uh, the to identify the concentrate the, the contribution of different factors. And this time you can see here for the CO2 contribution. And then that's basically if you have an increasing CO2, it's gonna, gonna increase your vegetation growth. When you have higher vegetation, it can decrease uh, dust emission. However, for land use, when you kind of like modify the land too much and uh, kind of cut too many trees and actually it can uh, cause an increase in dust emissions. So these are opposite um, like impacts. Um, so for us to remember. And then after we see these um, emissions, and we also always want to be prepared for the worst scenario. So here I chose a fixed CO2 scenario uh, in the RCP 8.5 and the difference between 2100 and the present day. And based on this emission, so I use GeoScan to calculate them, to, to simulate the concentration of dust. And you can see this is basically for the whole uh, Southwestern North America, you can see this is an increasing trend of uh, dust concentration. You, in, you only see a small region, and that is the, the decreasing trend of dust concentration, but most of them is uh, pretty severe. And the reason, another reason we want to highlight this um, fake CO2 scenario because there are a lot of researches and also a lot of uncertainties on how CO2 fertilization can support the vegetation. There may be a stretch hold, and then at a certain point, at a certain level of CO2, uh, just vegetation no longer benefit from CO2. So that's also like a reasonable assumption here. Okay, so that's basically uh, like the whole story. And I want to do like a, a summary of uh, our dust and also wildfire uh, results. So um, like on the upper panel, that's the result for wildfire. So you can see the emissions and the increasing emissions, especially over the northern States and uh, that's also for the uh, the national parks and uh, the, the the big national forest area. And then we also see the concentration correspondingly increase over this area, like the big national forest area. And um, on the other hand side, and uh, for dust, this is under like the by the end of 21st century, we can see if we consider the fixed CO2 scenario, and it, which is the worst case scenario, you can see an increase in dust emissions and which cause an increase in dust concentration over the whole area. And so, yeah, just for, if you consider the whole picture of the Western US and then maybe they use this one and to the North and the wildfire can dominate. And then for the South and dust can dominate and increase in the fine particulate matter under the future climate. And that's kind of conclude our story today. And um, thank you for listening and happy to take questions. Thank you so much for uh, the very interesting talk. Let's see uh, if we have some questions. We don't have questions yet, it seems, but uh, while we wait, I'd like to hear from you. Um, you used a, a resolution of uh, half a degree and 0 0.625 degrees for uh, doing the analysis on the wildfire, um, which is, pretty fine concerning uh, global uh, or large continental uh, modeling, uh, but fires are really uh, sort of localized uh, in space and time sort of events. Uh, what are the, the limitations that using such a, such a larger, uh, relatively speaking, larger um, grid, um, uh, you know, what are, what are the limitations that uh, you, you had to face? Yeah, that's a really good question and also a fair question because when you consider this vegetation model and this vegetation model actually different model, they all have different uncertainty and also these uncertainties are pretty large. And that's also why the model, they also these are um, 
global models, and then they have to kind of focus on like a, a relatively coarse resolution, and then to consider most of the, the uh, driving factors. However, we are trying to work on this side and then focus on like a specific domain and then increase the, uh, the resolution. And uh, maybe we can reach to up to maybe one kilometer resolution, maybe for the California area. And uh, so in this case, we don't need to zoom in to see all the details like the terrain details and the meteorological details. And that's another limiting factor because um, for the meteorology, we also need to have this uh, relatively high resolution meteorology to drive this uh, vegetation model, right? So once we have these uh, high resolution uh, emissions, they can use maybe high resolution modeling tool and then to simulate and generate maybe high resolution results. Yeah, like WolfCam is a really good tool and then maybe it can go down to one kilometer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, still no question from the interwebs, but um, and I, so maybe I missed it. Um, so it's really interesting to see the how um, loss of vegetation and increase in dust are sort of intertwined. Um, and and as, as I said, maybe I missed it. Is um, is just um, it's it's both, right? It's it's the increasing wind and the fact that there is bare um, bare terrain that is going to increase um, the, the dust. Is that correct? Did I get it right? That's a very important point I need to uh, actually clarify. So for the future uh, simulations, I do use uh, future meteorology to drive the vegetation model. However, for that time, I couldn't um, like couple the GIS model with the GeoSCAN model completely. So that's why we didn't consider the future meteorology um, impacts on this um, concentration side. So the emission is changing, but we assume meteorology for the, like in the GeoSCAN model stay the same. So that's basically meteorology driven emission side and then drive uh, the concentration side. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we have a couple of questions. Um, somebody asks, uh, can you can you expand uh, on the West uh, Texas region where the dust emission decreased due to land use changes? Uh, what in the model is driving this result? I really want to explain this. <laughs> so this is um, something actually related to the calculation. And uh, let me show my... Uh, actually, let me share my screen really quickly. Mm -hmm. So here I mentioned we use a threshold for uh, complete suppression of dust emissions. So for the special um, region in the western Texas, and it is possible for the vegetation just um, reach the threshold. That means um, that's also like why under the future climate, if you have increased uh, vegetation, then um, based on this calculation threshold, and then you no longer generate dust. And that's why also a possibility why you see uh, a decrease of um, uh, dust uh, concentration like dust over here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, another question from uh, Anonymous. Um, yeah, I'd like to remind people that it's nice if you guys remember uh, to put your name. Uh, it's, it's, it's nice to have a name when I read the question. Uh, in some projections, the wildfire season will uh, extend, but you only have three months uh, there, uh, January, no, July, August, and September, I think. Uh, do you expect any uh, underestimation from that? Um, so, you mean the total uh, wildfire emissions? I mean, we are currently focused on these um, these three months because uh, normally these uh, three months we see the highest wildfire um, emissions. So we are not considering from the total fire emissions perspective, but if we consider the total, you're absolutely right. We do need to expand the simulation. And uh, actually our simulation results is focusing on the whole year. And we just didn't focus on this um, changes in wildfire season 
uh, in this uh, in this project. But this is definitely something we need to look into. And actually, I'm working with a uh, as an with an undergraduate student and trying to identify like how the virus season change over different Western US areas such as California and Alaska area. Yeah, and all these areas and welfare has been a really, really big concern. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. I mean, if 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 everywhere looks like around here, you might have to include from from January to December because we, we got a really big fire uh, last last December. Very scary. Definitely. Um, I think uh, I would just add a little bit more to this question. So also because this kind of future prediction is uh, they all have really high uncertainty. And that's also why we want to focus on the times uh, that has a higher emission and just trying to uh, focus on one piece of the information. Yeah. And that's also why like every time when I present the future, I always start with the present day to make sure the, the present day simulation is kind of like reasonably viable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see if we have, oh yeah, Brett. Um, your wildfire modeling suggested a large increase in emissions and concentrations in the Yellowstone National Park area. Do you know why model highlights that area in particular? Yeah, definitely. I will use another figure to show this. Um, I think, this one should be a good figure to show here. So I, I guess I should also include the map for the total bell, total living bell mass uh, over the whole Western US. But here, I think this may be some uh, reasonable uh, figure to show this, uh, to explain this question. So in this area, you can see there are actually high, um, high level of total living bell mass. And uh, that's also why like, even though you see the decrease uh, for these living biomass or uh, some migration of trees, uh, maybe to the further north. And then you still have a lot of forest and you still have a lot of trees to support the burning. And that's, um, yeah, so in most of this area, and so if you go to uh, this region, so all these high fire emissions, um, if they want to, if we match these with the uh, with the tree map, these are actually forest, all big forest area. And especially for the national, uh, for the Yellowstone Park, that's definitely like a high fuel load region. Mm -hmm. And also some other things uh, to also consider is if you remember one of the previous slides that I showed uh, the increase in temperature and decrease in precipitation, that's also cover the, uh, the the National Forest National uh, Park area, like centered as a Yellowstone Park. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay. Uh, Justin, uh, I'm just thinking about 2020 in California when we had strong activity in October and November. I asked the question uh, about extended wildfire season earlier. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah thank thanks so justin much. yeah thanks justin yeah uh it is just crazy october november december fires um yeah yeah definitely i think it's really really crazy especially like the first time i saw um this figure and i found it's really really surprising i mean um like most of the things actually happened in recent years especially last year and i mean the last year and the year before and um I think definitely like wildfire can, can expand, the fire season can expand. I mean, if you really tie everything with the climate change, especially temperature and the precipitation, and uh, you can see, also see like how this high temperature uh, kind of time can last. And this can also be another factor to evaluate uh, how this fire season can also uh, can expand to other months, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if we have uh, one or two more questions. Uh, if we don't, uh, I wanna thank you once more, uh, Yang, uh, for the very interesting um, seminar. Uh, and I'll, um, we'll take the discussion uh, in the, in, in, in this, on the Zoom side. And I wanna thank you everybody who connected uh, with the stream, uh, on the stream platform and asked questions. 
thanks so much for uh, for the good discussion and thanks again uh, Yang for for your seminar thank you so much and if anybody have any questions after this just feel free to email me and uh, yeah you can definitely find my information online. <laughs> thank you so much <laughs>